everybody, and welcome to our episode. So like I mentioned in our intro, we have someone here that I find very inspiring and who's just, just doing really, really cool things and doing it in a way where it's like not really asking permission, like I've got something to, of value to add and I'm just going to do it. So with that, Amy, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Okay. So I want to start off, you know, when we think about stuff like mental health and we think about wellness, it, you know, it sounds good, but there's got to always just be this space of like, there's this whole system in place. So it's like, Hey, wait a second. We're in charge of this stuff. We're in charge of mental health. We're in charge of wellness. You know, we're the therapists, we're the psychologists, we're the, these people or we're like the dietitians or the doctors. Who are you to be getting involved in this? And something that sticks out to me about your story is like, well, I'm, I'm the person that's doing this, so screw it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> that's what I was going to so, say. <laughs> yeah. So tell us how, first tell us about what you're doing and how you started. Um, so I have, uh, yeah, I have a business that I now offer wellness coaching services. Um, and I blend punk rock primarily and wellness into this one ball of awesome. And really, I just, I mean, my roots are in the punk scene and, you know, music and stuff like that. But then um, I was never uh, a typical punk rocker in that I've, you know, I've never drank. I don't do drugs. I don't claim straight edge or anything, but like, it's just, I've always been into wellness stuff. Um, and so I've been working in the wellness industry in a variety of different forms pretty much over the last 20 years. Uh, and then this business, um, is two years, two years old now. Um, and it's just, it's everything that I love in one. Mm -hmm. All right. But what was the tipping point? The tipping point from like, huh, this is something I like, it would be cool if this existed to, oh no, I'm going to do this thing. There was no specific aha moment. It was more, I know that I'm an entrepreneur, like in my blood. And I knew that I wanted to do this business around wellness, but when I actually launched it um, several months before COVID, it looked totally different. And then COVID happened and like everybody, you have to like regroup and, you know, restructure. So I did that. And then that's when the Collaborative Resource Hub, which is kind of like a project within Wellness Provisions, was born. It's just sort of been gaining its own momentum and sort of defining itself at, at this point. It's almost like beyond my control. I mean, I guess in response to COVID restructuring and then just this figuring out like, how do I put music with wellness? Because it's, they're both, you know, my loves. And so, yeah. Give us from the inception point. So when you first started it, cause you said like how it looked versus how it is now is different. So tell us like what it looked like in the beginning. Um, so it was wellness provisions. And then I had something called, uh, the wellness collective, which was local within Wilmington, North Carolina, um, getting a bunch of different kind of, you know, wellness related practitioners on board. So chiropractors, um, estheticians, massage therapists, all different people. And they offer something, um, you know, like a unique, uh, service exclusive to members of the wellness collective or, you know, discounts, things like that. So it was a way to connect people to, you know, have this network of really trusted professionals. Uh, obviously with COVID that was gone. Yeah. Um, there was another part of the business called, um, workplace wellness, which was, uh, a, a display that would be set in the break room to have, you know, versatile functional remedies available to the employees. So, you know, no one has to go, you know, out of the building if they have a headache or if they feel like they're getting sick, ah, oh, the remedies are right there. Um, that obviously was gone by the wayside because, you know, offices didn't exist anymore. So, um, and then I had these snack boxes and then the wellness kits and the wellness kits are what still, you know, remain throughout, which is, uh, basically easy to shop supplements. Mm, okay. So what is it today? So now it's still the wellness kits mm -hmm. and then uh, deciding to offer wellness coaching services, which mm -hmm. I never wanted to actually do while it's, you know, I've always, I've always done that through the various, you know, you know, you know, jobs that I've had or just with friends or family. I didn't want to be like a health coach kind of person, 
but then it turned out that it sort of still answered the need of the community. You know, uh, I call my followers friends of Welly P. So the friends of Welly P, you know, they needed uh, this service because people were reaching out or they had questions or um, with the Collaborative Resource Hub, I do the interviews with musicians and they share what well-being means to them. So basically, it's a lot of conversation happening, and I wanted to be able to actually one-on-one -on -one kind of work with people and help them down their path. So I guess it was in response to what was building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, tell us about the podcast, too, because it's like, it's super cool. It's a very interesting thing. How did that start? Uh, I mean, so I work with a guy who um, he's sort of like a like a meditation teacher, mentor, sort of like we just brainstorm really well together. And I don't know, somehow talking with him, it just sort of the idea just appeared. And then again, like, yeah, it just sort of took its own form. But um, chatting with, I wanted to chat with people like, you know, punk rockers who you would not expect to, you know, make a point to exercise or to do breath work or anything, you know, healthy related. You're expecting them, judge a book by its cover, you're expecting them to not take care of themselves. So having these conversations where they're unearthing this healthy stuff, um, I think it's, it's inspiring, it's motivating, it's important. So yeah, uh, what I find interesting about it, like, so, um, and for, again, the uninitiated people listening to this who aren't from punk and hardcore, um, you know, so Amy and I and, and most people involved with the, the company that I that I run, most of us came from the punk scene. And I didn't find the punk scene because things were good in my life. I found the punk scene because I was like on the outskirts. You know, I was a kid who didn't fit in. I got bullied a ton when I was a little kid. I had a lot of family dysfunction in the home. It was like I found punk as a, as a shelter. Like I really needed shelter and it's where I, I found it. But what I didn't, what punk, punk gave me a lot of things, gave me a place to belong, a play like a sense of like my ideas matter. I have a voice, but what it didn't necessarily give me is like, Oh, you suffer from like anxiety or depression, or you've got like, you know, the, these traumatic incidents in your life or like you were really bullied and it's made you like vulnerable to types of relationships. Like, Punk didn't and necessarily shouldn't necessarily like be a therapeutic space where you learn things. And so I grew up, as a lot of people grow up, just reliving patterns. But I was a bit delusional because I thought growing up in punk meant that I was okay from that. And I had this like big crossroads where I really realized it's like, oh, no, like, like, I, I'm not happy and I don't know how to be happy. And I had to go and do some like real deal therapy. The more I've talked about that and the more I've been open about it, the more I've found a lot of people in punk have experienced the same things and have kind of their own ways of dealing with it and their own their own kind of journeys that they can speak to. That's why, Amy, I think like your podcast is so cool because it's great seeing notable people in punk be very open about it. And there's that sense of like, oh, I can relate to that. And oh, that's what you did. Great. Well, maybe I'll try that for myself. Exactly. Yeah. And that's exactly what I want people to have access to and to walk away with is the relatability and feeling comfortable, you know, that here's someone that I look up to, you know, I've been listening to this band for 20 years or whatever, and I can do what they've done. You know, it resonates with me. And so, you know, it's nice to just have a safe space where you feel like you can relate to someone it's important and that's what that's what i want this to offer people yeah, yeah so if you were going to boil it down like almost like if if you were saying like this is how you would recommend wellness provisions to someone what would you boil it down to like what does wellness provisions do today what does it offer today uh, well, I mean, I guess like the the tagline for the Collaborative Resource Hub, I think really sums it up. And it's we're bridging the gap between mental health, wellness and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. um, so connecting all those dots. And mm -hmm. that's that's what we do. So where's your client base? Like where are you, where are you finding where are you finding your clients or where are your clients coming to you from? Um, well, it's uh, I mean, all over, all over. I mean, different countries. Um mm -hmm. There's a guy that I coach in Panama. There's a guy that I coach in Mexico. There's a guy um, in the UK. So, but what it is, is they're finding wellness provisions through the interviews. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're watching these and it's like, wow. And it's funny because I don't even talk that much in the interviews. Mm -hmm. I just, 
you know, I give, you know, the musician the floor. They're the ones talking. I chime in a little bit, but because of the conversation, whoever's speaking it, it, it connects with them. And so they reach out, but yeah, people are all over, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, well also like you've got a great way of being like, you know, like, a. so I'm, I, by training, I'm a therapist and like the great therapists, they say very little, right. They, they just ask good questions and you're really, really strong at that. What gap did you see that made you do this? I guess just the absence of wellness, of mental health, of awareness of how you can treat yourself. Because here's the thing, you know, like kind of like what you were saying with like the punk scene, um, we're all still an individual and we all have brains and bodies. So it's like, it doesn't really matter what you're wearing or what clothes you wear, you know, the music you listen to, whatever. It's you're a person with a brain and a heart and that needs to be looked after. There's just, there's so much trauma that people have in their lives and they're, they're resorting to substances and, you know, it is prevalent in the music scene. Um, and I just want, I wanted people to realize that there's another, you know, there's another way. I just wanted to have these conversations because I like talking about wellness stuff. So it's sort of another like, you know, I don't care what you think I'm doing what I want. And like, I just want to have these conversations. And then that's also sort of how they've taken their own life, you know, and they're built their own momentum is, um, I just, I just do what I want. <laughs> but, but that's how great things happen. So like, again, for like the audience, every single thing that we have in this world exists because someone or some group of people was like, oh yeah, let's just do this. And like, some of those things, people were like, oh, yay, go, go and do that. That's great. But for a lot of those things, people are like, you can't do this. Who the hell are you to do this? Oh, some other expert should do this. Yeah. And I had that. I did, actually. I had even some friends, like, um, you know, some people I've known in the punk scene for a long time. They're like, that's not going to work. No one wants to talk about that. You're not going to find any anyone in any bands to talk about this stuff with you. And I'm like, mm, I'm doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. And the reaction's been great because you've gotten some really like, I, I mean, people where I'm like, holy crap, like, for example, Milo, like, whoa, Milo's on the show. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been very fortunate that this project has, has resonated with people uh, and they've, you know, they've wanted to have these conversations. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's been some heavy hitters. It's pretty rad. All right. So let's let's talk, though, like because there does have to be like a level of like expertise. And so when I say that, like I'm, I'm putting on the hat, two hats, business owner, entrepreneur, who's like, I totally take risks, take a leap. It's like, I can do this. I'll figure it out versus therapist who has like specific training, like degrees, like all of that kind of stuff. I love and admire the like, hell yeah, I'm going to do this. I don't need to be it. Like, I don't need to have like all of this stuff. I'll, do, I'll do this because I know there's a need for it. And the therapist side of me is like, okay, so how do you know you're doing a good job? Well, one thing, because that's also been brought up, you know, to me as well. And so even like as far as the wellness coaching, um, and it sort of goes hand in hand with the Collaborative Resource Hub. So if someone feels comfortable enough to try and reach out and they want help from me and work together, but I'm like, wow, what you need is beyond my wheelhouse. I'm not comfortable, you know, going there. I'm not, I don't have enough you know, training in that or qualifications in that, then what I can do is connect them to someone who does. The doors open. And if you come in, I will help you. Or if it's beyond me, I will connect you to someone who can um, and still offer that support. Um, and yeah, like because I've interviewed a few therapists uh, in the guide series. So there's the musician series and then the guide series with the Collaborative Resource Hub. And um, one of the women, she she provides, it's a foundation called um, Sims, uh, based out of Texas, and they will connect you with a therapist, but they don't just give you a list. Um, she will actually make sure that it's someone who's a good fit for you. So I was working with someone and she needed to get back in therapy, like proper, you know, to see, a, you know, a proper counselor. And so I connected her to you know this organization and then they found her someone while i'm still working with her too so yeah, yeah. i can kind of just help i just want to take care of people and make sure that they're 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 on a good track and so 
whatever that looks like, I will provide for them. Yeah. Uh, would you mind if I share a philosophy I have around helping people? Mm-hmm. Um, so never open up a conversation that you can't close up. And so it's kind of like a surgeon. You don't want a surgeon to come in and then halfway through, they're like, oh, yeah, I actually don't know how to do this surgery. I'll figure it out, though. To be able to be in that space with helping people is like you got to have like a high level of understanding of like where your skills begin and end, like where's the beginning and ending of your ability. But the thing that I find interesting is from kind of like a gatekeeper perspective, like there are a lot of professionals be like, no, you have to you have to have these degrees to do this or you have to have this background. And I think that is absolute bullshit. I think that there's all sorts of degrees of help. And sometimes help can be someone who's like, oh, no, like I have here's where my skills are. And I totally know where it begins and ends. And maybe you come in and my beginning and end is going to serve you well. And maybe it's you come in and I realize I can't actually I can only do a bit with you and I'm going to help connect you. So the the value of someone who can just connect with people and and be a connector to other services or someone who can um, uh, kind of juxtapose their services with some uh, other services. There's a whole spectrum of care that matters and gatekeep uh, people and keep people out of helping uh, others. All that means is less people get meaningful help. And that's like a terrible result. So I love what you're doing and I love just like the honesty about um, how you approach it. And I think the results speak for themselves because you're like really out there helping people. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the other thing is, again, like I've been working with people for the majority of 20 years. So it's Mm -hmm. like I don't have a piece of paper, but I've got a couple decades of, you know, working with people, which to me, you know, and I'm self-taught with anything I've ever done. Like to me, that's the most valuable you know, experience, because you have the passion, Mm -hmm. then you're, you know, you are learning, it is an education. Totally. Well, like how many music degrees are in the bad brains? Like how many people went to like, you know, like, like went to like music school versus the impact of that band. So let's talk about your history. Like, tell us a bit about coming up in the industry and like, you know, like what you've done prior to this. Yeah. Um, well, I was born and raised at Whole Foods. So Mm -hmm. I started working at Whole Foods market, um, in 2003. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, when I graduated high school, I worked for them for a total of 11 years. Uh, I took a couple breaks, just living places where there wasn't a store. Um, but so that was the majority of my, um, you know, the retail, the, the leadership experience, all of that, you know, was really kind of created at, at Whole Foods. And then I've worked at various other grocers and like the wellness department and, and you know, led teams there. Um I've been uh, like a sales rep for wellness brands and I've done demos for wellness brands. So it's all um, it's but it's all, you know, connecting with with people and having the product knowledge, um, you know, and trying to guide people towards wellness. Yeah. So is this like a chicken or the egg kind of scenario? Like, do you think you're just naturally someone who's willing to put themselves out there and take that leap? Or do you think you learned that via punk rock? No, I've always been that person because when I was um, in elementary school, I had like businesses, I had little side hustles. Uh, I, at like holiday time, I charged my family, I charged my family money <laughs> to wrap Christmas presents or Hanukkah presents as it were. Um, but, uh, or like if my dad needed to borrow a few dollars, like I need some gas money. I'm like, first of all, why are you asking me? But second of all, you're gonna, I'll give you five, you give me six back. <laughs> Um, I, I used to make, uh, I think in middle school, I made pillows out of old t-shirts. So Uh I had my mom advertise at her work. Uh, you know, if there's an old shirt that you want to turn into a pillow, Amy will make it for you. It costs this much money. I made a golf course in the easement, like the woods behind our house. I like turned it into this whole like putt putt course using our croquet set. And I dug a hole and lined it with a trash bag and put in like beads and filled it with water and like it was 50 cents a game. I mean, I've been doing this stuff. I've so that's what I mean. Entrepreneurship is like in my blood. (laughs) I really like that, like a loan shark attitude or money. Like, did you ever have to like ever have to lean on your family when they didn't pay you? Like, were you like, (laughs) yeah, no, like, yeah. I mean, I had, I had a sense. No, no, I didn't have to. (laughs) All right. So how did you find punk? My brother actually, who's two years older than me, um, Mm -hmm. I, I guess he was sort of the one that introduced me to it, although it was sort of happening at the same same time, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but probably him. Uh, 
and uh, you know, he was skinhead. He shaved in in like high school, and um, yeah, we just started going to punk shows. So I was, I think, thirteen when I started getting in. First, it was third wave ska. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not proud of that, but you have to start somewhere. Um, yeah, and then I got into like street punk stuff, and um, and then when I was fifteen, I started dating this dude. Uh, who was into really good punk, 77, UK82 stuff. And so that sort of, that was like a musical shift for me. And by then I also was running my screen printing business, Pure Mania. So question for you. How many, when you were in your ska phase, how many different words did you try to like fit ska into? <laughs> <laughs> like Skaba, Skaba the Hut? Or <laughs> oh God, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know that I did that. Okay. Well then you weren't too deep then you weren't like, you know, you weren't trying to like, you know, like rework the English language into some tribute to ska. So I can respect that. Right. What are the bands that changed your life? What are some of the bands? Bands, um, the outcasts, which are 77. Um, I think they're, I think they're from Ireland. This is one thing that's interesting about me mm-hmm. is I can tell you the band but I don't know much beyond that. I'm not super into bands like history, the biography of them, mm-hmm. uh, members, names. Like that's not something I, I retain. But um, the outcasts, I think, are probably like a Generation X, uh, the Depressions. So just all like 77 kind of stuff that just mm-hmm. shaped me. I wish you could see Patrick right now. Patrick is sitting across from me and he's like, Patrick is like a big like mane of hair and it's like flying all over the place right now. He's super excited. He wrote down Belfast when you Oh, is that where they're from? Okay. Okay, cool. So they are from Ireland. Good. Yeah, okay. Okay, man. He's very excited right now. He he's he's feeling good. All right, so these are some of the bands that that changed your life. What have you learned from punk that you wouldn't you didn't learn anywhere else that has impacted the way that you go about your business? Punk just sort of brought out something that was already in me, which was, you know, basically just like the fuck you attitude. Mm -hmm. Um, It sort of like was like, okay, like I can do that, which always I also just I I see the irony in it that like, you know, you don't fit in. So then you you get into punk rock, but then you're just where you're still wearing a uniform and you're still, you know, it's just another box. It's just not society's box. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think just that I do what I want attitude, just it, it made it more prevalent. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very real that you mentioned that around how punk can be super conformist too. Like I'd actually say in my experience, punk and especially like hardcore where I'm at is like some of the most like rules, rules oriented people I've ever met. Like very like if it's not this, it's uh, I'm doing a voice, but it's not this little thing. It's like, OK, calm down. Like. Just calm down. Nobody really cares except for you. It's interesting though, because I can be like that too. Like, yeah, well, it's got to sound this way. But like, punk and hardcore has such an insane value, but it can totally stymie people. It can stymie their growth. It can make them these weird conformist people as well. So it's cool that it, for you, it just helped shape something that already was inside of you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, though, is the scene, it can be very judgmental, which, again, is sort of why, like, you feel like, oh, I have to be drinking because all my friends are drinking, you know, so it's just like, I just, yeah, I just, I'm hoping that what I'm doing is somehow impressing upon people or just showing that, like, fuck everybody else, just do what feels right for you. Earlier on in our conversation, you talked about kind of like people just taking control of their own wellness and like, Tell us more about your philosophy in that, because I think a lot of people, they're like, oh, you know, like I feel so disempowered and like almost like they have to go through some system to do that, where you seem to be more of an advocate of like, oh, no, like you can just totally take charge of your own health. Well, I guess I'll I'll start by saying this. Not everyone is at a point in their life where they're actually really ready to start healing, whether it's like, you know, a physical ailment or mental stuff. Um, but when it clicks and they, you know, everything just, the stars align, um, and they realize, okay, like I'm ready to, to jump in and, and, you know, take care of myself. Um, yeah, being your own advocate, you have to, because the standard 
that society gives us for health, um, in my personal opinion, I don't think is the healthiest standard. If you want to feel better, you need to take action and take charge and create a path for yourself. But that's also where, you know, the wellness, having someone like wellness coaching can be helpful because, because I, I, this reminded me one of the essays, like I have a blog and one of the essays I wrote is like, I can be the person with the machete, you know, clearing the path ahead of you so that you have a clear space to walk down. Like if, if you're not comfortable clearing that brush, then that's why working with someone who can sort of just support you on that path is important. But you got to want it. You have to have the intention to want to feel better. And um, there's so many, so many options out there. That's really interesting to me, uh, the idea of like, you have to be ready to do it. Um, so like, I'm a guy that's like, I've done like 12 step work, I've gone to therapy and all of that. And there's been the times where it's like, I was kind of like, just like, it just felt good to be in the process because it made me like feel like I was doing something versus times where I was really doing something. Mm -hmm. And and there's not a right or wrong there. Just for our audience, um, for their understanding, how would you really define a wellness coach? Like what does a wellness coach do? And then maybe if you could even contrast that to like how that would be different than a different kind of health professional. Yeah. So I guess typically what do people do? You know, they don't feel good. They go to the doctor, their primary mm -hmm. care. And, you know, a primary care doctor, I, I kind of tie ego into this is sort of how I kind of, I guess, talk about it is um, so many conventional doctors, you know, their training is it they have the answers. This medication is what you need. Um, and there's not a lot of opportunity for other options. Um, so you're sort of just like on this really skinny path. And the problem is there's, there are so many different ways of healing and they're not always open to alternative, you know, medicine. And so a wellness coach which I actually it was one of the essays was like, what does a wellness coach do? And I was like, I wrote in and I'm like, I would have to Google it because again, I don't technically know. I just know what I do. Mm -hmm. And that's what matters to me, which is I'm here to encourage you, support you, you know, provide information, um, help you get blood work, you know, talk to your doctor if you need blood work, find, you know, whatever. It's just, it's, it's just supporting someone on the journey. But um, so many conventional doctors don't want to admit that there are other ways and other people who could help their patient. Yeah, the way I look at it is kind of like a case management style of wellness. So like from a therapeutic point of view, like you can have like a therapist, a social worker, a doctor or whatever, and then you have a case manager who manages all, all of that. And so if like if I was if someone was, came to a community services to get therapy, they'd probably have like a case management and the case manager be like, Hey, what are the various things this person's doing? Let's put these things together so that they're getting the best version of it. And back when I was working as a therapist, it's what we'd call like a wrap model is like you're wrapping them with services and you're being kind of like, you're helping them be a picky shopper. Like why this therapist versus that therapist, or if that's what your doctor told you, like, Hey, maybe let's go over here and get a second opinion. Does that like kind of align with what you're talking about? That definitely does. Um, for the for when the people yeah when I kind of want to make sure that someone is getting that external care if it if it fits you know what what they're looking for but yeah that does sound like it um, but it's interesting too because a lot of people who don't have something severe or clinical um, they're just sort of like feeling a little lost in life it's the same same like so many things that are often really fantastic remedies which is like nature sunshine eating well, stress management. And those are things some doctors will recommend and others just don't even talk about, you know? I mean, if you look at like the standard food pyramid of like the whatever standard American diet, it's like, that's not <laughs> really set up for optimal health. So again, which is why it's like, you can only kind of go so far with conventional medicine. It's great for like crazy when crazy shit goes down. If you're in like a car accident, you need your legs, you know, attached to your body again. It's it's imperative for that. But uh, wellness coaching, blending with like alternative, you know, medicine and stuff, um, I think can can be a little more holistic. Well, yeah, and like also like go into the food pyramid. Like get at that stuff is crazy. Like I was raised on the on the food pyramid, and that is the biggest bullshit. 
And it's crazy that like our, our health and the way we eat were hijacked by these corporations who like just wanted profit and like doctors were just like, okay, I'll do that. It's like this idea that like all institutions are temporary. So if, let's say, let's say you look at a wall and a wall is well built. You know what? That wall might outlive, outlive you and me, but that wall is temporary. All institutions are temporary. All knowledge is in like a building stage where it's either proved or disproved or augmented or grown. Everyone who says they're an expert is not an expert. They're just an expert on what they happen to know now based on what they were taught in school, which could change next year, the year after, the year after. There are no experts. There, there, is, there is nothing stable. There is only people trying to figure it out together. And when I think about the medical system or the mental health system, like, hell yeah, like there are people I could say inarguably are experts that I listen to and, and, and whatever. But even then, their expertise is not permanent. It's impermanent. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be continuing your knowledge. And actually, I just actually, <laughs> I got off with her five minutes before I had to jump on here with you. Mm -hmm. um, I was having a coaching session with a woman who she's a yoga teacher. She does some, I guess, blending like trauma um, some kind of support with that through yoga. Mm -hmm. And here we're doing a coaching session and she's like, you know, it makes her feel like, well, I know all of this stuff, but yeah, I still need help from someone else. And mm -hmm. so it's sort of the same thing. It's like, I told her we're all still developing and growing and learning. And, you know, earlier today I was super stressed out. I wanted to like punch a hole in the wall, but, and I do wellness coaching, but it's, we're, no one is perfect and we're all still learning. And, and that's what you want in someone is, uh, you know, continued growth in themselves and their education. Totally. And like that blind belief in like experts. So like I, this is where I get a little sticky because like I do have the background. I did go to school. I did do all those things. So like so part of me is like, well, wait a second. I went to school for X amount of years to like have this level of stuff. And then I also can look and be like, dude, there's so much stuff that I didn't didn't know or that I did poorly or that I made a mistake on or I should have I should have done this or some should have done that. It's an interesting thing when we talk about like health, because like we want to go to people who can help us because we're coming because we need help. But that idea that there's like experts necessarily and they know the answer is like really skewed and i think all right how society deals with the idea of go to the experts or listen to the experts is like tenuous at best that there is expertise out there but to blindly follow it and not put yourself in the driver's seat is like a hazardous thing yeah i agree uh i agree <laughs> all right so let me ask you something that i i have strong opinions about um what do you think about self-diagnosis? So like reading something on WebMD and saying, yes, that's me. And I'm going to die in two days. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, it's not. It's not great. You need you need someone you need. You need a proper diagnosis. However, having said that, because there's two sides to everything, so many people are misdiagnosed. You're going mm -hmm. to someone seeking, you know diagnosis and so many things are similar and they get muddled and you know especially with like mental health stuff but no self-diagnosis it's but it's all a process too you know you ha you have to try some things see what's see what works how am i feeling a, a, a real healing process it's a journey and, and it does take a lot of trial and errors and part of it is self-diagnosis but no a lot of things you do need blood work to show something, you know, something concrete. Totally. So I, I have like strong feelings about this. Like I, I have this, this friend locally, Adam, who's like really, really, really strong professional, like really serious education, like works in the, in the social services, like really, really um, smart, capable, like very, very um, community minded. We had this kind of debate about it and, and he, he wasn't like strongly saying like, yes, self-diagnosis is the way, but we kind of came from different perspectives. And here's where I come from. Everyone's diagnosis. I don't feel, I don't feel how I want to feel totally valid. You know, like you want your life to be different or you want to feel physically different or you want to feel mentally different. Like when someone says like, I don't feel right, it's totally valid. 
where I get concerned is where people is is where anyone just kind of gives themselves a self diagnosis by reading things on the internet or hearing someone else's story and being like, oh, that's how I feel and that's it. Like, and then they operate on that as the principle. That is where I get concerned. And I have like real concerns about that. I think it's good to do research, to hear other people's stories, to do reading, to like listen to like podcasts, uh, to, you know, to, to essentially do research and then come to a service provider with a bunch of different things that you think like, hey, I've done some research. This is what I think it is or this is what I think is going on for me. So you could take that journey together. It's almost like doing like pre-work. And also not necessarily taking a service provider's word as law. Like, no, this is what it is. If you don't like what they say, go to someone else. Go to someone else. Like, figure it out. To just do it on your own and then operate completely on that basis, I think is it's part of the work of getting better, but it's not all the work. And I also recognize not everyone has access to service providers. Not everyone has money. I do recognize there's all of that there. But I will say as like someone who's been involved in like mental health and health work for a, a long time, I love that people do research and they, they, they want to figure out what's going on for them. And I like that you start with the, I want to feel better, but to really get better, you got to get something that has like a plan in place and interventions in place. And you got to go to some kind of person who helps, helps you with that. Mm -hmm. And often, especially if it's, you know, mental health, like often, you know, a pharmaceutical is what's going to correct, you know, a chemical imbalance. And not everyone wants to be on pharmaceuticals, but sometimes, you know, you know, herbs and natural remedies just for, and it could just be your body, but like, it just might not cut it. So you need additional, you know, support. It's an interesting thing. Cause like, I'm not a, I'm not a proponent of like a doctor's going to be the person to help you or a therapist is going to be a person to help you or a counselor or a coach or a this or a that but you really want to do all this on your own, like, and, and figure out the plan and figure out how long that goes and, 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 and how it's going to mesh with the rest of your life. Like, don't you think someone should help you? And that's where I have more thoughts about, like, I, if you feel bad and you want to feel better, I'm with you. If you have a sense of what you think it is, I'm pretty with you. But if you're going to create and execute on a plan all by your own, that's where I get a little like, oh, oh, like, I think you need some help there. Yeah. Yeah. It's even, it kind of, to me, it's similar to like, uh, getting like a food sensitivity test to figure out if you have food allergies, mm -hmm. you know, they do the, the blood work and you get it back and it shows whatever, you know, level one, two or three, whatever your reactivity is to that food. Um, but that is, should be like a guide. So if you're eating the food, how do I feel? And then you look at the blood work. Okay, that confirms it. But it's like, because if it's like zucchini, is it the zucchini? Is it, uh, was there a pesticide on it? Was there, you know, there's so many variables. So, but it's a good guide in the process of figuring out, you know, what's going on. So it's sort of, you, you have to have your own knowledge with something concrete and you just blend them. Totally. Um, and actually, just to close the loop on that story about my friend Adam, uh, who is a brilliant, ethical, wonderful person, we didn't have like huge differences. I was coming more from the like, you know, there's got to be a plan. And this is someone who works with really vulnerable populations where he was like, well, that's not always accessible, not just from a monetary thing, from a systems thing. It's like, you know, like if you go to get help and everyone doesn't look like you, let's say everyone's like a straight white male that's trying to help you, then that you might not be able to get help there. So I do want to go to that next space is like, I'm all here, like people need to have a plan and need to have help. And, and I agree with that. But how do we actually make things more accessible to people? And that's something that I think wellness provisions does really, really, really well. So how do we follow that thread of like, okay, we can say like people, if people want to feel better, they need to figure out what's going on for them. How can we get more people to access services? Like how can, or how can we make services more accessible to people, to all sorts of different people, different walks of life? I mean, I think, honestly, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's mm -hmm. a matter of, you know, it, maybe you try, a friend talks about chiropractic or say from one of our interviews, someone talks about like a Reiki session or something. Mm -hmm. And then if it, resonates if it clicks again because i just think that when you need to hear something you'll hear it at that time mm -hmm. so then you know you've, you're going down that rabbit hole and like oh you find someone who offers reiki services near you or something like that and you can get like energy work but um i guess 
I don't know, finding some kind of a wellness community somehow to be mm -hmm. within. If it's, you know, like a 12 step program or whatever it is where there's people whose purpose and, and goal is, is to feel better than, you know, different modalities, you know, they'll be spoken about, I would think, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Totally. And the other thing I'd encourage people is to do what you're doing. Like, Hey, if you see a, a gap in a market, so for example, if you see people that aren't getting get, getting a kind of like mental health support or any kind of wellness support, don't wait for someone else to do it. You do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it. And um, even on my website, there's a resources section of books, some podcasts, YouTube channels that are geared towards, you know, healing. So mm -hmm. there's resources you know on there even for people to take things into their own hand and at least start the process yeah totally and like for people listening like you know part of why you know amy not to i know you're we're speaking live so not to speak about you like you're not here but like part of why we wanted to have amy on the uh, on the show is like there's nothing i admire more than when people are like Oh, like, I'm just going to go do this. And like, people need help. So I'm going to go help them. And then like, I'll figure out the rest later, but I'm going to launch, going to get in there, make a difference. And then I'll refine the process. And it sounds like that's what you've done. And that's huge. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty much exactly the process. <laughs> so what kind of feedback have you gotten both challenging feedback and then also positive feedback? Um, I'll say like, it's probably like, I don't know about numbers, but a very, very small amount of just people being, you know, a few questions or like, should you really be doing this? Or you don't have a piece of paper kind of a thing, but like overwhelmingly positive feedback, both on the, you know, what you're doing is just so important. It's so needed to, um, you know, like from the musicians and stuff, which is also fun talking with the musicians because, you know, they're like, it is so refreshing to talk about something else and something important. It's just not music related. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, people realize these conversations need to be had about this stuff. Um, and then the people who are, you know, the friends of Wellie P, people who are watching the interviews or who are following on Instagram or whatever and, you know, reaching out to saying like, I saw this interview and this conversation helped me so much. Um, there's one, there's one guy who he watches like every, every episode where it's about, um, sobriety and it, it, it's helping him on his journey. I even have people, which I think is really, it just makes me so happy. It's really special. Um, they'll reach out like if they're in a rough patch and like, we're not even proper, you know, coaching or anything like that, but like on Instagram, they'll DM me and say, you know, this happened, I fucked up, you know, but whatever, and I'm working towards and I'm just like, I'm still offering support and encouragement and just understanding. Um, but it's just special that people are feeling like they have a safe space and support. Mm -hmm. And it just makes me super happy. Heck yeah, I love that. All right. So uh, as we're closing off, I have three questions for you. The first is, you know, people come to this podcast from all sorts of different backgrounds. There's uh, people from the corporate world, there's entrepreneurs, there's musicians, there's artists, it comes from all, of, all over the place. But what they usually come here for is to hear about leadership. From my perspective, like I truly feel like you're a leader, like a huge daring, huge guts, and you're making a real difference. So if you're thinking about leadership, what's your philosophy of leadership that you live by and that you apply to wellness provisions? I think the biggest thing is the idea of, you know, uh, walking the walk, talking the talk, that whole thing where mm -hmm. when I was a team leader or a manager, you know, in wellness departments, I, I was on the same level as my team. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's important to be on an even playing field. Um, so using the remedies yourself, um, you know, doing these breathing exercises yourself where you're on, you know, par with someone. Um, so like leading by example, basically, mm -hmm. um, empowering people, motivating people, inspiring them. Those are, I mean, that's, I think those are really important. And those are things that I look to do with wellness provisions. Okay. Awesome. So second, this is a, a tough one. Uh, for someone who's just kind of easing into your podcast or, or just getting in that space, what are the three episodes that you'd recommend of being like, yeah, these are like, this really represents what we're about? Um, 
It's interesting because usually I, I suggest people episodes based on what they're dealing with, you know, um, but Milo from The Descendants, yes, that's <laughs> that's been quite a successful interview. Um, he talks about trees in it. We talk about trees, which is fun. Another one that a lot of people really got something from was Blag from The Dwarves. Uh, he goes on to talk about why, um, you know, like if you're in a band, you should say fuck you to the bars trying to give you alcohol. Everyone like loved his rant about that. So that's worth one. And then um, one of my favorites was Stacy D from Bad Cop, Bad Cop, mm -hmm. because she is like a ray of sunshine. She's been through some stuff and PMA to the max. Mm -hmm. So it was a good chat with her, too. Hell yeah, that's awesome. All right, final question for you. Uh, for someone who wants to engage with your services, who wants to work with you, uh, where do they start? Uh, the website, wellness-provisions.com or Instagram at wellnessprovisions and then just reach out. Like, I run a business, but I am a person. You can come at me like a person. Okay, right on. So as we're closing off, anything you want to say to anyone out there? Uh, yeah, manage your stress levels. Find time to meditate, even if it's for five minutes. Oh, good. Okay. Well, as a person who has uh, been told that many, many times and rarely has done it, uh, I'm going to take you up on that. So, Amy, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, you totally killed it. Really had so much value. Um, I really feel like anyone listening to this, like, don't let anyone else be in the driver's seat of your health. Uh, if you need help, reach out to Amy or someone like Amy, a wellness coach that can help guide you through the process, but take charge. Like, don't worry about the system. The system's a system. Everything's in, impermanent. There's like expertise is kind of wishy-washy at best. There are people who can help you, but they don't have to have the final say in your health. You get to have the final say. So with that, Amy, thank you so much. Spencer, drop the beat. What?